it. He is here. He is working in this place. He's taken all of your burdens and taken all of your shame.
message. God, I I pray that they feel your presence all around them, that they feel your arms surrounding them, God, that they feel the peace that, God, only you can provide. God, we lift them up. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Amen. It was wonderful worshiping with you this morning. Take this time, wave hello uh, to one of your friends, make a face, uh, and then you may have a seat. Hey, Life Point Church, this is Jim Thomas. Welcome to Graduation Recognition Sunday. And today, I'd ask that you join me in recognizing all graduates and their accomplishment, whether it be from high school or college or some other kind of program. Today, though, I do ask that you help me focus in on two young men who've come up through our youth program, Zach Shaver and Connor Smith. Zach recently graduated from uh, Central Dolphin Votex School and plans on a career in mechanics. And Connor recently graduated from Liberty University Online Academy. And his plans are to continue to go on to Liberty University in a history track. I know some of you watch these two guys grow up uh, and, and grow older, and here they are ready to take on a new phase of life. And this is an exciting time. It's also an exciting time for their faith and, and for growth. I would ask that you continue to pray for them as they move on to these different phases. But also to help them do that, we do have a small gift for them. A small Bible that's easily uh, tucked away in a bag or something and can travel with them whenever they might need it, and a devotional, so they might reflect each and every day on what God might be communicating or directing them to do. Now, I'm very excited about this day, and I hope you are too. Please take time, if you see them, to congratulate them. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful and blessed day. Well, good morning, Life Point Church. I'm Andrew. And I'm Tilly. And we are so glad you're joining us this morning, whether you're here in person or watching online. And just a reminder that we are one church in two locations. So whether you are watching online or are here in person this morning, we're glad to have you and worship alongside of you. 
If you're new with us today, we just want to send you an extra special welcome and say that we're really glad that you took some time out of your day to spend it with us. We have a red new person card sitting in the seats if you're here with us in person. We'd love for you to fill that out and take it to the welcome table by the garage door out in the lobby. We have a small gift we'd like to give you to welcome you here to LifePoint. And no matter if you consider yourself old or new to LifePoint Church's family, we would like you to fill out the blue next step card or the gray prayer card if you're interested in taking your next step in your faith or if you have something heavy on your heart that you would like our staff and prayer team to pray for you throughout the week. You can drop both of those cards off in the offering boxes as you exit the auditorium. And for all of you watching online, as always, we have digital versions of all of those cards linked in the chat if you're watching live or in the description below if you're watching on YouTube later in the week. And you won't want to miss it. Next weekend here at LifePoint Church is Building Dedication Weekend. Starting on Saturday at 10 a.m. will be building tours, followed by a dedication service at 11 a.m. And last but not least, a barbecue lunch in the parking lot for all. We really look forward to seeing you there and celebrating all the provision that God has done for LifePoint Church within this last year. And coming on the heels of that, on Friday, June 25th, we're going to be having our first annual bike night hosted by the LifePoint Riders. Starting at 5.30 in the evening, there's going to be live music, great food from some food trucks, as well as a whole bunch of really cool motorcycles to check out while you're here. And as a reminder, this is a family-friendly event, so even if you don't own a motorcycle, you are more than welcome to come enjoy the music, the food, and just time hanging out together. And last but not least, we have a slightly bittersweet announcement for you. For the last 62 weeks, if you can believe that, it has been our pleasure to welcome you and inform you. And hopefully entertain you a bit. Every single Sunday during announcements. But starting next week, you're gonna notice that announcements will look a little different, a little bit different format, and you're gonna see some new faces that are gonna better represent the entirety of our church family here at LifePoint. Now we can't thank you enough for your support and encouragement over, well, these past 62 weeks. Now, don't worry, we're not going anywhere. You'll occasionally see us on announcements, but we're truly excited for this next step in LifePoint's announcements as you get to see some new faces. So for the past 62 weeks, we truly hope you have enjoyed it as much as we have. And now it's time for us to turn it over to our lead pastor, Glenn Pfeiffer, as he continues our series, Juicy Fruit. So, let's dive in together. Let's dive in together. Let's dive in together. And now let's dive in together. 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 <laughs> Good morning, church. Great to be together today. Great to hang out and worship together. And I don't know what's going on with the first two rows here. I mean, I don't know. Everybody's kind of afraid to come forward. I mean, I, I shower, I brush my teeth, I try to take care of things. But anyway, feel free to continue to move forward. And uh, it's super exciting to see numbers of you coming back and being part of what's happening here and continue to invite your friends and family to join us. So glad you're joining us online as well. We got a great group of people meeting with our live stream. A lot of people watching later in the week via YouTube when you're on vacation or away or just at a distance. So we're, it's just great to be together, to hang out together and now to spend some time in God's Word together. And we're in this series, Juicy Fruit, and uh, when we were brainstorming as a team about titles and everything, I mean, Juicy Fruit came up, and, and of course, the first thing I thought of, as maybe you did too, was I thought of the gum. I thought of the gum, and, and uh, I've chewed Juicy Fruit gum, and, and maybe you have too, but I'm not a big fan of it, though, because it, it loses its flavor very quickly, like, 23 chews. I mean, I didn't like scientifically come up with that, but you know, 23 chews, something, and, and it's lost its flavor totally. And I suspect that a lot of the gum that maybe has been under that desk, like when you were in middle school, you were in high school or college, and you got that desk, and you ran your hand underneath the bottom of it to see what was going on under there, and you hit a bump, and you're like, man, what's going on there? And you're like, you realize it's gum, 
and you kind of get your foot out, and you're like, man, I, got, I don't want to touch it. So you kind of get your foot out, and you try to knock the thing off. And, and if that doesn't work, well, then you have an unsuspecting neighbor. I mean, when they're not looking, you could maybe change desks with them. They wouldn't know. Maybe I'm being autobiographical about that. I don't know. But, but th there's no doubt it's, it's probably a gum like juicy fruit, you know, the gum on the ground, the gum squished against the, the uh, bathroom stall because it's lost its flavor. And you didn't want to swallow it. You didn't want to swallow it because you know it takes seven years to digest gum. I actually don't know if that's true. Some, maybe there's a doctor here who could, could tell us if that's actually true. It takes seven years. But you didn't want to put your system through it regardless, so you just stuck it somewhere. Some of you, you need to admit it. You did it too. But the juicy fruit we're talking about today is way different than that. This is juicy fruit that doesn't lose its flavor over time. It's actually the fruit that God wants to grow in our spirit, in our heart, in our lives, in our attitudes, in our minds. Fruit that is going to be abundant, that's going to pay off in a big way in our lives. And it's interesting uh, to follow the theme of fruit in the Bible, this idea of fruitfulness and of fruit itself is, is everywhere throughout Scripture. Uh, 106 different times in the Old Testament, the word fruit is, is found. And we find it 60 times in the New Testament. We also find it multiple places in terms of like a metaphor for like a vineyard or a vine or a, a place of growth or flourishing where the same idea comes into play that it's God's will for his people. It's God's will for everyone that he's created. It's God's will for your life right now that you would flourish, that you would prosper, that you would find success, and that you would bear amazing, awesome fruit. This idea of flourishing and of, of living a fruitful life is at the heart of God's plan for his people throughout history. We read that in for example, the book of Hosea, just one place of many. In Hosea 14, verse 5 through 7, it says, I will be like the dew to Israel. He will blossom like a lily. Like a cedar of Lebanon, he will send down his roots. His young shoots will grow. His splendor will be like an olive tree. His fragrance like the cedar of Lebanon. Men will dwell again in his shade. He will flourish like the grain. He will blossom like a vine, and his fame will be like the wine from Lebanon. Here again, we get to the heart of God, that God wants his people to flourish, and he does everything he can to make that possible. Two different times here, we see the word blossom, that he will blossom like a lily, he will blossom like a vine. It speaks of fruitfulness, of bearing something that brings life and vitality to us and others. And we see that God does multiple things here. He sends the dew to make this happen. He sends um, down his roots to build the roots. He, he cultivates young shoots so that they will grow, so that they will ultimately flourish. Again, just one picture of many where God has good plans for your life, good plans for your future, good plans for our relationships. He wants us to produce fruit. Jesus says the exact same thing as we move into the New Testament and see what, what God has to say about all people as well. In John 15, 8, it says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's interesting here, Jesus doesn't say, you know, it's, it's to my Father's glory that if you take faith seriously, things will go pretty good for you. You know, things will probably be good. Or if you take serious, faith seriously that, you know, you, things might align in a good way at some point for you, better maybe than it would have been. No, actually, that's not at all what it's saying. Jesus is saying that if you take faith seriously, it's the Father's will that you would know him and in fact you would bear abundant, abundant fruit, bear much fruit. This is God's will and purpose for our lives, that you would be juicy, bearers of amazing, lasting fruit. All of this means that God wants to pour out his favor into our lives and make us fruitful so our lives actually get better. 
You see, that's what a lot of people don't understand in our world today, where there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation about faith, what it is, what we're about as Christ followers. That God's desire is to pour out his favor on all of us, everyone who he has created on his people and those who take him seriously, so that our lives actually get better. But I've talked to people over the years who've said, you know what, I'm, I'm not interested in, in this life of faith that you talk about because in their mind, maybe because they've, they have bought into the disinformation or they've had a bad religious experience, they kind of step away from that and say, you know what, I don't want that. That's all about kind of depressing, dour, you know, downcast type of faith. It's all about being rigid and boring and judgmental, and that's not the life I'm signing up for. That's not the life I, uh, life I seek. That's not the life I want. And so they kind of say, I'm just not into the legalistic, joy-sucking religion as if that's what we're talking about because we're not, and that's not what Jesus is talking about, and that's not the fruit the Scripture talks about. God has in mind something entirely different where we become not frustrated, but fruitful. Not strapped down by legalism, but set free to be the best we can be. So that you and I can become the best version of, versions of ourselves. So that we can be reaching our full potential. That we can bloom and flower and produce fruit. This is God's will. A life where we prosper and are successful in the ways that matter. In the ways that last. And this is the fruit that never loses its flavor. This is the fruit that endures. In the book of Galatians, we read about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And so far, we've talked about a couple of them. John talked about love, and Greg talked about joy. And I want to talk about the next juicy fruit God has in mind for us, and that is peace. And to understand peace, we need to unpack the word itself, but also the context where we find it. We read about this in Galatians 5, through 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit, the juicy fruit God wants to produce in you, the things that God wants to see show up in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit and in your attitudes is love, joy, and now today, peace, but also patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what flourishing looks like. This is what prospering looks like. When these things show up in your heart, that's a sign of God's presence in your life. When these things show up in your attitudes, this is a sign that, you're, that God is working and, and developing you and molding you and growing you. God here clearly has our best interests in mind and it calls into question the disinformation campaign of culture that says if you take faith, faith seriously, life gets worse. God says actually it's completely the opposite. It's 180 degrees different than that. Life truly gets better. And the peace God gives us is multifold. There's peace that God wants to, ex, us to experience in our lives and our relationships, but the starting point is a very particular type of peace that God wants you to have in your life, and it's peace with God. The first type of peace is peace with God, the assurance that you're right with God now and will spend eternity with him when this life is over. You see, God wants you to have crystal clarity as to where you stand spiritually. God wants you to have absolute certainty as to where you stand in your faith walk with God. And a lot of times in our world today, there is a lot of uncertainty. I talk to people many over the years, and even this past week, I talked to someone who was really unsure about their future. They were religious, they had done some religious things, they did some good things here and there, but they weren't sure exactly if they died, if they would go to heaven, if God would be happy, if they were right with God. They really struggled with that, and it's interesting that this is actually a main theme in the book of Galatians, because the Christians, the Christ followers in the city of Galatia, whom Paul is writing to here, were dealing with the same type of uncertainty. 
They were unsure about where they were going. They had this insecurity about faith. Was God happy with them? Was God mad at them? Had they done enough for God? Could they have done more? They had this perpetual roller coaster going on, and it really was draining them. And what made matters worse were teachers who came along and were fueling that insecurity. And they were saying that, yes, you need to accept Jesus into your life, but it's Jesus plus doing other religious things equals being right with God and salvation. So it was always Jesus plus. Yeah, you should do, you know, pray to accept Jesus. Yeah, do that. Jesus plus you need to do some of the Old Testament ceremonial laws. There's certain things you need to do. And if you do those, well then, yeah, then you're probably gonna be right with God. Or it's Jesus uh, plus jumping through hoops and hurdles that come with what these teachers were bringing, mainly Jewish, Jewish type things that you add to faith so that you can believe and be saved. And it's interesting when we take that path of Jesus plus stuff, plus my effort to earn God's favor, we inevitably feel that insecurity because we don't know if we've done enough. If we're trying to earn God's favor, could we have done more? Is there something else that we should have said, something else we should have done, another path we should have taken? Or have we done enough? And I've met a lot of people who are really unsure about that. Were they right with God? These people didn't know where they stood with God. And it profoundly impacted the level of peace in their own lives. And Paul addresses this problem when he says in verse 7, in the same chapter as the fruits of the Spirit, he says, you were running a good race. You had it right. You had it right. You had this relationship with God, with, with Christ. But who c cut in on you? Who kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion, it doesn't come from the one who calls you. That kind of persuasion of, of doing religious things that some pastor or priest or ecclesiastical person adds to the faith journey it is not the persuasion that God has in mind for us because we're saved by grace. Paul even talks about that. It is by grace you're saved through faith, and it is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. You see, when we get to heaven and we have this new heaven and new earth thing happen, there's not gonna be any pride. And, and so the person says, you know what? Uh, I'm here, you know why? Because it was Jesus plus I did some good stuff. Like, I helped 18 old ladies cross the street over the course of my lifetime. I mean, that's, I mean, I don't wanna, I don't wanna boast or anything, but I, that's pretty cool. How about you? I mean, I'm here because I helped 15 old ladies cross the street, and, and the guy who's done three more is like, I knew it, I knew it. Like, I, I got you, dude, I got you. And it's like, are we gonna import that into heaven and say, God, I got here because, man, I'm an old lady helper. I'm the best one. You know, is that it? Is it about my works? It's about what I do? No, there's no pride in heaven. There's no boasting in heaven because we're all saved by grace, God's unmerited favor. And then once we ha know him, a couple things happen. We're freed from the religious treadmill of earning God's favor. We get off the treadmill and we find ourselves able to finally be at peace, peace with God. And we now do good works, not to be saved, but because we are saved. In other words, works are not the root of salvation. It's the fruit of salvation. It's the result of a life that's aligned with our purpose, with our creator, with Jesus as savior. We want to do good things now. We want to honor him. We want to please him. And all of this gives us assurance. You should have absolute certainty where you stand on your faith journey today. Paul talks about that further in Romans 5, 1 through 2. He says, therefore, since we are justified through faith, in other words, justification means declared righteous. When you pray to accept Christ into your life, when you admit that you've sinned and fallen short of what he's called you to be, that you've lived in self-willed ways, and you ask him to forgive you, it's not a magic formula. 
It's a reorientation of your heart towards your creator and savior. You're declared righteous by entering into that personal relationship. And so you're justified through faith. And then, what does it say? We have peace. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is awesome, great news that a lot of people in our world need to hear, and maybe you need to hear it today. Because sometimes we're just not sure, we're uncertain, we have these doubts, and we're like, I don't know if I've been good enough, and God's saying, Liz, just accept me into your life. Incline your heart towards me, admit your sin, allow me to forgive you, I'll set you free, and that's what, exactly what happens. When we know we're forgiven, we have peace. When we know we're free, we have peace. When we know our future is secure, we have peace. When we know we're right with God, we have peace. When we know that when we wake up dead, and you will wake up dead one day, your eyes will close, your heart will stop beating, your lungs won't take in any oxygen. We did a whole series on that, when you wake up dead. Because we're gonna wake up dead, every one of us. But here's the thing, we're gonna wake up and our soul and spirit will be in the presence of a God who says, I know you. I know you, you've been inclined towards me, you've had a relationship with me. And we're ready for that moment. And we can absolutely 100% know we're ready and we can be ready and we can walk in peace. And so this is the first type of peace that God wants you to experience. Do you have peace with God? Do you know you're right with him? You can. He wants you to have that peace. And that becomes the building block for the next type of peace that God wants you to experience in your life. It's peace with others. God wants you to experience profound, deep peace with others. He wants you to experience a new life supernaturally reshaped and transformed by Jesus that changes how you interact with other people. So once we get this right between us and God, God's saying, I'm gonna give you power and the ability and an inner sense of confidence and peace that's gonna enable you to get this stuff right. Once we get the, the vertical right and our heart is right and inclined towards God and we wor we're working on that, now he's gonna help us on the horizontal stuff so that we have peace with other people. And the truth is that this is always going to be hard. This is not easy. There's no like panacea, like you know, cure-all, easy moment. This is tough stuff. Relational work is hard. Sometimes we avoid it. But God's saying here that I want you to have peace with others. And, and it's interesting to look at a world scrambling and struggling to find peace. I mean, when you read the newspapers or you watch news or you're online watching uh, things happen and you get your news through YouTube or Yahoo or whatever, wherever you get it, you look at the world and you're like, man, just struggling. The world cannot figure out why it doesn't have peace, doesn't know the problem, and doesn't know the solution. Like, how do I obtain it? There's this big struggle, like, I don't understand the problem, I can't figure out the solution, and everybody's scrambling to find those answers. And yet, it's interesting how Scripture talks about that every one of us has this built-in contrary nature. We have a contrary nature. The Bible calls that a sin nature, that we're, we're basically our default is towards self-interest. We self-advocate. We're good about uh, our ideas, and we're going to slam yours, and we're good at pushing our agenda and our plans. We, it just comes natural to us. We have built into us, hardwired by sin, this dysfunction, this brokenness. So the world is searching for problems as if, as if the problem is out there somewhere and the solution is out there somewhere when scripture says actually the problem is right, right here, like it's in me. The problem, it's in you. But there's a solution too. And the world may scoff at the idea of sin of a selfish default. It, the world is dismissive of it. Like, oh, that's just religious stuff. That's just a bunch of religious people talking about this or that, and yet they continue to struggle and scramble. I don't even know what the problem is. How do we solve this? They don't know. 
they will continue to spin their wheels till we realize there's something wrong inside us. And Paul here gets super specific about the nature of this sinful self, this sin nature. He tells us and shows us what it looks like in the exact same context as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So we have to look at it. In chapter five, verse 19, he describes this, this kind of default to self. He says the wrong things the sinful self does, well, they're clear. Being sexually unfaithful, not being pure, taking part in sexual sins, worshiping gods, doing witchcraft, hating, making trouble, being jealous, being angry, being selfish, making people angry with each other, causing divisions among people, feeling envy, being drunk, having wild and wasteful parties, doing other things like these. I, I warn you now, as I warned you before, those who do these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And, and why is that? Because all these dysfunctional, broken things, they, they're not gonna be in heaven. They're not gonna be in that new heaven and earth. So they don't have a shelf, they, they have a shelf life. They're, they're done soon. So deal with them now. Get rid of them now. They have no future. So don't live for these things. They're gonna be done away with. Don't try to import them into the future because God's not gonna let that happen. And here's a laundry list of actions and attitudes uh, that we need to be careful a bit about. Now, we don't all fall into all these things, but all of us have fallen into some of these things at one time or another. We do what we feel like doing. We follow our heart. We listen to our friends, and they say it's okay, it's cool, and we just do it. But we have to ask the question as we look at this list, and we see a culture embrace this, and people cheer this on, like this is, this is the way to do it. How is it working? Is, is it going well? Is it really great you know, to burn your family to, to the ground because of sexual unfaithfulness? Like, is that really a good outcome? Is that what you want? You know, is it great to wake up with a, just a raging hangover because you drank too much the night before? Is that like taking you to a good place? You know, are you, is your life better, you know, when you're like divisive and you get other people to hate other people and you hate other people and you throw grenades into the chats so that we can get some controversy going? Is that, is that division and drama really like good? Is that making life better? And, and if you say, well, I kind of like that, it, you know, kind of step back and say, why? Like, why? Why do I like the division in drama? What's going on inside of me that's inclined towards things that, that actually uh, uh, diminish me and diminish my relationships? Like, what, what's going on inside of me that makes that attractive? Ultimately, it comes down to this, that God has a way better path for our lives. He has a way better direction he wants us to take and he has way better fruit he wants us to bear. And that's why with this list of, of kind of this selfish default that, that's in me. I've done these things. You've done these things. We've fallen into this. There's no super spiritual person who says, yeah, those other people, they do that stuff. No, we've all fallen short. There are no super spiritual have it all together people. We're all in the same boat. But Paul's saying, that's not the way it is now. Because now he lays out a contrast. This is this list of self, selfish ways that we em quickly embrace. But, he says in verse five, chapter 5, verse 22, but the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, but God's work produces something way different. Fruit. Fruit. The contrast here is very stark. It's between the old you. This is the way you used to be. These are the things you used to do and the new you. It's the contrast Paul is laying out here between the previous version of you and the new, improved, better version of you. He's laying out this contrast between the things that, that once came easy and natural for you. Easy and natural to now a commitment you're making to do some hard work. Because that's the biggest contrast here that, that we gotta really kinda grasp onto. 
that it's easy to take this first list and take this list of things and, and pursue that. That's, that's easy to do. People want you to do it. They cheer you on. The culture says it's cool. Go for it. Just be yourself. Follow your heart. Who cares if you screw up other people or mess up stuff? Just have fun. Just go for it. And the world cheers that on, and then our lives get worse, and we wonder why we got these worse problems. And it's like, man, that's easy. It, it caters to our default to self. But God says that if you do the hard work of building this other stuff, this fruit into your life, man, it's gonna pay off in a bigger way than you ever, ever imagined. Now, every summer, something that I really enjoy doing is uh, pulling a garden together. And I have a small yard, and so I do container gardens, and I get some tomato plants, mainly tomatoes, because I like them. So uh, thank you to Ken for, for hooking me up with some good plants this year. Appreciate that. But got some plants. And uh, you know what happens when you have a garden. You basically uh, you get some containers, in this case with a container garden, and you get some soil for, you know, you get some good soil and you, you fertilize it, you put the plant in there or you plant a seed. You put the, the pot in a place where it's gonna get the most sun, it's in a good location, and then you water the thing, like, water it like crazy. You gotta give it water. But there's, there's one other thing that you also have to do, and this is huge, is, is that inevitably, you know what shows up, right? Weeds. Weeds show up, so you've got a weed, and you've got to take care of that and be diligent to, to, to take care of your garden. And some of you might even deal with other things, like in my neighborhood, rabbits. And I, I've mentioned this before, that in downtown where I live in, in Hershey, there are a lot of rabbits, and they're proliferating as we speak, like little ones are popping out, of, like these, they're multiplying like rabbits. I, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. So I have worked really hard to rabbit-proof uh, my yard. I have a fenced-in yard, but they get under it, so I've been using chicken wire under it. And it's like, a, it's like a prize fight. I've won a couple rounds, but I knew they'd come back. So just this last week, after not seeing a rabbit in my yard for like nine months, I'm like, man, I'm kicking her butt. I'm winning this thing. There is a rabbit. I open it up, and there's a rabbit there, and he's looking at me with, you know how they got one eye because they're facing, like, one eye, like, so defiant, so defiant. Like, this rabbit is like, man, I'm, this is my yard, and I'm going to eat whatever I want. I'm like, seriously? So I'm like, I, I decided that I got to figure out what, how this guy got in. So I didn't chase him hard. I just walked at him really fast, and he was trying to bounce around the yard to find you know, how to get out, because I wanted to see where he got in, so I'm going to watch where he got out, and I found it, and then I closed it up, but these guys are very, very persistent, very clever, sneaky things, sneaky, you know, and in the first service, I said, you know, maybe I, I should just get, like, uh, some kind of, you know, weapon or something, like a 22, and of course, that would mortify Denise, like, shooting rabbits and stuff, very, very bad idea. Although, when I did mention that in the first service, I had several people who were like, like, you know, I got one. I got one. If you, if you need, you know, you need a weapon, we can take care of that. But these are obstacles, obstacles to a fruitful harvest. And for us, all the hard work we do pays off with juicy fruit, with tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, from the garden. It's the same picture of what God wants to do in our lives, that our heart and our life is like this garden, and God wants us to be really careful about the soil that we're using. And so the question is, you know, how is the soil of your heart and your spiritual life? You know, is it, is it pliable? Are you a humble person? Or are you stuck in some hardened, spiritual, personal pride? You know, are you just kind of stuck in in this pride, you know, that, that's made your heart hard, like, like this stage. Sometimes our heart can get hard like this stage, and, and yeah, you can throw a seed down, man, it's just gonna bounce off the hardness, and you can try to put a plant down and put the roots down there and everything, but man, the hardness of this stage isn't gonna allow anything to take root or grow. Sometimes our, our soil, the soil of our life, of our spiritual life, can be like that. 
It's not going to grow because, because there's an intractability in us. There's a stubbornness within us. There's a pride within us. There's an unwillingness to change or adjust. There's a lack of humility in our own heart and lives. And so we need to get the soil right. We need to get the fertilizer right as well. That there's this fertilizer of God's word that, that comes down and enables us to, to grow and become all we want to be, to develop deep roots. We need to be exposed to water and the sun, and, and in this case, not the S-U-N, but the S-O-N. Like, where are we getting exposure to the life and teaching of Jesus? Anywhere in our culture. They just, it's dismissed. And yet, he's the Lord of life. He's the one who's come to give us life and life more abundantly. He's the one who wants to develop juicy fruit in us. And we're not hearing a word he says anywhere, except in church, except in good churches that speak his word. Are we getting exposed to the sun? These are the things that we need to do. But this takes work. To bear fruit, we got to deal with obstacles. And we especially need to do hard things relational work in order to have peace. Because all these words here, all these descriptors, all these attitudes have profound implications for our relationships, for our connection with other people. All of these tendencies to get selfish impact our connection with others. And so we need to take the soil of our life, the garden of our spiritual direction, very, very seriously. And that means getting the soil right, the fertilizer right, the sun exposure right, but also to do some serious, serious weeding. We need to get some of these things out of our lives. We need to come along and look at our life and say, I've done the right thing with the soil. I've done the right thing with the fertilizer. I've got the, I'm watering it. I've, I've got sun exposure. But weeds have a tendency to just keep coming back, don't they? We need to pull out the weed of unfaithfulness. We need to pull out the weed of jealousy. We need to pull out the weed of rage. We need to pull out the weed of anger. These are things that don't make our lives better. And in fact, weeds have this ability to steal the nutrients that God wants to use to grow our faith. Weeds steal, out, steal the phosphorus and the potassium and the nitrogen from the soil, and they steal the things that enable us to grow as well. So we need to pull out the, the sense of divisiveness in our world. We need to pull out of this world this sense of hating other people, being angry with other people, having these wild and crazy parties that later we, we regret and say, man, I, I don't know what happened to me, but I know that wasn't me at my best. And we can't just do it one time. You know, some of us would say, I got the soil right and, I, and I'm, I'm bearing some fruit, but but it's not enough to just pull the weeds a couple times because what happens, they, they want to come back and they don't just want to have a segment of your life. Weeds don't want to just have part of your life. They want to take over. They want to take over. So we have to be vigilant to continue the work of weeding these things out of our life. Because here's the truth. At some point, you're going to work at your spiritual life and then all of a sudden, this weed is going to come up it's going to pop up out of nowhere. It's the weed of an old habit. It's an old habit. It's like, man, I used to do that, but I'm not going to do that anymore. And if we let it grow, it'll take over. We got to pull that old habit out. We're like in a relationship. We're married. We're connected. We're faithful to somebody. And then all of a sudden, the tempter comes along and there's your old flame. Somebody you knew and cared about in the past shows up and friend requests you. And it's like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we should just talk and you know, have a conversation. No, actually, I'm blocking that. I'm blocking that out. I'm pulling that weed out. When we have a situation where we have tension with another person or we disagree or there's a problem and, and the old self had a way of dealing with that, the old self would say, I'm gonna fight. I'm gonna battle you. I'm gonna argue. I'm gonna overcome you. I'm gonna get carnal, whatever it takes to win out over you. And you're like, man, that's the old way I dealt with people. That's the old way, and we pull that out and say, not anymore. So we have to do some weeding. We have to block some rabbits because these are obstacles to bearing the fruit that God wants us to bear. Peace, then, is the payoff. 
You see, all the hard work we do relationally pays off. Peace is the payoff of a, of a garden of a life weeded well, taken care of, that is reshaped, reoriented, and transformed by God. James 3 talks about this very thing. He says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving and considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. This is what God wants to build into your life, that you're peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy. You're bearing good fruit, impartial, sincere, You sow in peace because you're a peacemaker now, not a peace taker. This is God's plan that you would have peace with others. And this doesn't mean that you're gonna be reconciled with everyone because you do hard work. This doesn't doesn't mean that you're gonna be close friends with everyone because you've done some hard relational work. This doesn't mean that things are gonna be easy in your marriage or with an estranged family member, or easy in your workplace, or your dorm, or wherever you are in your neighborhood because you're doing this hard work. No, it doesn't mean that. But it means this, that despite what others do in their gardens, you are being ultra careful with your own. You see, this is huge, that despite what other people do with their gardens, what weeds are going on, and what kind of fruit they are bearing or not bearing, You're not focused on that. You're taking care of your own garden. You don't control other people's gardens and what they do, but you do control your own, and you're vigilant, and you're careful. And so when we get this right and we're humble, when we're careful to reject this stubborn pride that all of us can fall into, when we're careful to to be the kind of person that's willing to send out an olive branch, an olive branch that maybe somebody takes We send an olive branch and they take and they break the thing up. They break this thing up and they put it in a package and they send it to your doorstep via UPS. The broken up olive branch returns to you on your front step and you can step back and say, I will be at peace with all men as far as it is possible. I've done what I can do. I don't control the response. I control my response and I choose peace. This is when we're ready. We're ready for God's best. It means we're ready to experience shalom, well-being within our soul. This is how we get ready to be all God designed us to be. This is how we reach our full potential. And this is how we receive the peace that God wants you to experience today and every single day to come. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're working in our lives to build and grow juicy fruit. Peace. Peace that surpasses all understanding, that transcends our understanding. Peace with you and peace with others. And I just want to take a minute with every eye closed as we pray. If you've come today and you don't have the absolute assurance of your salvation, if, you're, if you don't have peace with God, I wanna pray with you today because I've been in that situation. I've felt that, those feelings and God wants to give you the assurance, absolute confidence that when you breathe your last breath, you'll spend forever with him. Do you know for certain today that that's true for you? If you're struggling with that today, and you need peace with God, would you just raise up your hand real quick and put it back down? I'm not going to call on you or have you come up here. I I see hands today. I wanna pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone here who's taken that step to say, God, I I wanna have peace with you. I pray, Father, that they will just simply pray, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I've sinned. I've fallen short of what you want me to be. Forgive me my sins. Come into my life. Fill me with your presence and your power. Make me your child forever. Thank you that I am now yours here. I am now yours forever. I also want to ask today, if you've come 
and maybe you don't have peace with somebody in your life and it's tearing you up. It's keeping you up at night. Maybe you're just thinking about it. You wake up in the middle of the night, it's like this person's there and you're like, it's, you're angry and you're struggling. I wanna just say, pray for you today. If you're struggling with, in, with peace in a relationship and I've been there too, would you just raise up your hand real quick? Again, I'm not gonna call on you. Put your hand up and I wanna pray for you today. If you're struggling in a relationship with another person and you're just trying to find peace, I see a lot of hands today. I think all of us could raise our hands. I wanna pray for those of you who've done that. Lord, I pray for everybody who's taken that step to say, God, I need to release this that, Lord, you would give them the ability to do that now, that they would do what they can do and control what they control, that they would weed their garden carefully and remove uh, the things that inhibit and, uh, their potential and steal their peace. And I pray, Father, that they would be peacemakers in the midst of this, that they would choose to do the right thing even if the other person does not, that they would choose to be like you even if the other person does not, that they would choose to build the fruits of the Holy Spirit into their garden, even if the other person does not, and that because of that, God, you would meet them in a very particular, powerful way today, and you would give them peace for doing the right thing, for cultivating the right thing. So, Lord, be with them today, we pray. Even online, if that's you today, I want to pray for you and everyone here in person or online, that, God, you would work in our lives that, you would, that we would know we're loved, that we would have confidence in that knowledge, that we would allow you to change us, and that change would give us deep, profound peace. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I just want to remind you of today's offering. Thank you to those of you who give regularly to our church. You're a, a tremendous blessing. We really are thankful for you. Uh, there's multiple ways that you can give to our church. There's a box in the back on the way out if you'd like to put something in there. We also have online giving where you can give a one-time or a recurring gift uh, to the church. Many of you are doing that. Some of you are also sending a check to the church, and that's perfectly great too, uh, whatever works best for you. Uh, again, I want to thank you for giving and supporting what God's doing here, our collective community as we serve each other and our world. I do want to say if you're new among us, we're so glad you're here, so glad you're hanging out with us. Uh, please do not feel an obligation to give to the offering. Our offering is for those who regularly uh, attend and who give out of love to support his work. But we're glad you're here. And may God bless each of you as together we serve our God as we seek after him, as we embrace the life of peace he wants to give us. that prayed that prayer to accept Jesus in your life, welcome. We're so excited. Please be sure to find someone to talk to about that. We're very excited about that. And, and if you're someone, you know, that did raise your hand or maybe didn't raise your hand, you weren't quite comfortable, that if you're struggling with God, you're struggling to find peace with God, peace with others, peace with whatever is at the top of your mind, take this time of worship and just come and lay that burden, lay Lay whatever that is at the feet of Jesus, at the altar. Jesus is here. He is here to meet with you, to take that. You no longer need to feel overwhelmed. He wants to take that away so you can be feel filled with that peace that only he can provide. And as we sing this song, feel free to worship or pray, whatever you need. Um, you can stay standing, you can sit down, you can kneel on the floor, you can link arms, you can find someone across the aisle that says, hey, I need someone to pray with. Can you come with me in this empty row? I just, I need to pray. I need to, to surrender. I need to, I need to come to God. And it doesn't matter what other people are doing. It, it's just your relationship with God. That's all that matters. It's how you come to God. It doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. So just surrender. As we sing the song, just lay, lay everything at his feet. God's arms are open wide, open wide for you.
love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to keep the music going if you feel the need to, to stay and pray and worship. But for those that are ready, it was wonderful worshiping with you this week. Go and have a wonderful week. We'll see you back next Sunday.